How was your week? You don't have to really tell me, especially if it was bad. You're supposed to say, it's a great week, Dan. There you go. There you go. You all ate, ate well this week? Everybody eat okay this week? Yeah? You all have shoes and socks and clothes? So, I, so your week was okay then? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you've been taken care of for another week. Amen. And I'm just trying to remind you, you need to tell God thank you for all of it. Let's pray before we start. We're going to be in John chapter 17. Lord, thank you for the time that we have. Thank you for the blessing of the food, the friendship, the fellowship the life you've given us, the families you've given us, Lord. I, I just want to say thank you for all the good things. Lord, we pray for those in the world that do not know you as always. We pray for our governments especially. Lord, that um, you would remove from them the deception and give them truth and wisdom and understanding. Lord, we pray in all things that you would be glorified on this planet. We pray for our, our babies that they would grow up knowing you, that you would take care of them, keeping them healthy, safe. And again, thank you for what your son has done for us. Amen. The title for this, I was going to say living the complete life, but I like what Alan came up with in a nutshell. I liked his title in a nutshell. Because, so that's what we're going to title it in a nutshell. I'm going to recap some things for you, and then we're going to move into it. I'm not, because it's the day that it is, I'm not going to overwhelm you, I don't think, with a lot of stuff. But uh, um, we've been looking at John, we've been looking at the life of Christ, his movement through the, through the scriptures, how he started his ministry with that first miracle he did, moving on from that first miracle all the way to where we are now at the point in his life where he knows he is going to die. Just, doesn't that know you? Just, every time I think that, it's like, can, imagine it. You know, you know you're going to die, and you know how you're going to die. I never saw the movie The Passion because I don't want to see the movie The Passion, because I don't want to see that. But that is pretty accurate, I know. Yeah, from the, from the mindset of um, a Roman, you know, to scourge someone that severely. I, 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 how do you do that? I don't see how you can do that. But Jesus knows it's coming. Bring up John 17 for me, please. And you're going to see that his attitude is the exact opposite of what you would think his attitude would be. And there's a reason for that, and we're going to try and get through that today. Look, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. That's good right there. Now, his starting statement is, is not, oh no, what am I going to do? His starting statement is a declaration of a truth. You see that? It's a declaration of a truth. It's a declaration of absolute confidence. Do you agree? Yes, you can talk to me. It's family feast. Yes, glory and glorify in this text is used multiple times, over six times. The word given or give is used like over ten times. So you have this distinct flow of thought coming out of Jesus' heart. He's standing there praying, and it always fascinates me. Everybody thinks praying is this, but for centuries it was raising your hands and looking up like he just did. There's a level of intimacy being spoken of here, isn't there? Sure. 
what I'm finding, and this is, this is the direction I think we're going to go today, and I've been praying about it all morning. I actually did change my sermon. <laughs> just for the wise guys. Just for the wise guys. I uh, went to a place uh, on Wednesday, and those that came here on Wednesday evening for the study know about it. Um, there's, a, there's a place for traumatized children in St. Louis. It's called Great Circle. And they deal with children from five years old all the way up to 18, and these are kids that have experienced serious trauma. Uh, some of them have been so traumatized that if you even move towards them, they back up. They just, they just have been that abused. They come from broken families. They come destroyed. I sat in the class, one of the classes, there's more that are to come, uh, for six hours with a professionally trained counselor who was explaining to us in this first meeting how to think. Amazingly, and I, I will gradually release some of the information to you as time goes by. I have to reword it so I'm not stealing somebody's stuff. But <clears throat> everything he was saying was biblical. And I don't know that he even knew it. But it was very biblical. And what it was is you have to change your thinking. And as I sat in the class, believe, believe me, I was very convicted because as I listened to him communicate about how your childhood traumas affect the way you are in your adult life, I listened and I thought, that one lines up with me, that one lines up. I'm sitting there going, wow, I did not realize that those things had such an effect on me. But they did. Those of you that know my story... Prior to God pulling me out of the pit, I was a mess. I mean, I really was a wreck. Uh, so much so, like I told you on Wednesday night, in seventh grade, they took me out of every one of my classes and put me in a storage closet with one teacher. That's how bad I was. Okay? So, as I listen to him talk and give a secular view of how to help people think correctly... I'm thinking of all the scriptures that are popping into my head that are in our Bible that say the same exact thing. I, I wanted to say to the guy, but I didn't want to draw that much attention to myself because I had already drawn attention. But Because I, I was the only one there that was a pastor. But I wanted to say to him, do you realize everything you just said, God himself has said? I find it interesting that the Old Testament is full of trauma. I find it even more interesting that when Jesus shows up on the scene, he flips the whole thing upside down and he starts communicating exactly what these psychologists are now understanding about life. I'm not kidding you. It was almost verbatim. It was like listening to the New Testament. It was like listening to 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. It was like listening to Galatians uh, 1522, I think, is right. The gifts of the Spirit, fruits of the Spirit. Because he said to us from the start, you have to bring a person to a point of peace before you can actually communicate to them. Don't miss that. What happens when you are saved? You are brought to a point of there is no conflict between you and God anymore. You have to come to that point of peace with God before you can even hear Him. You can't hear Him otherwise. They proved it in their own studies. And I'm just sitting there. You, you would have had fun with me, I think. But He said that until you deal with the base part of the brain where you're being developed as a baby and growing up through those early infant years, until you deal with that part of them, they can't even reason. They can't even hear you. That's why it's a waste of time to yell at somebody who's in sin or who's destroying their lives. They, they can't hear you. And that was what this guy was trying to tell us. You have to get them to a point of calm. Then they actually can start to hear you. He discussed the subject matters of stress levels. He identified that you have natural healthy stress, which is like, I got to take a test. Or, you know, things that involve, 
you know, driving, you have to be careful. But then there's toxic stress levels. And when you move into toxic stress levels, what starts to happen to you is your IQ drops. They've measured it. And the more toxic your stress level is, the more you stop thinking. And when you reach the level of terror, you don't think at all. You become totally primal. You either run, fight, or freeze up. Now, your Old Testament's a fool is full of stories of people who had developed incorrect cognitive function. That's what it really is. You can spiritualize it all you want. There's no question that there's a spiritual issue. But the problem is our thinking. Our thinking will take us down a road where it's destructive. For instance, there are three types of authority. You have... Uh, social authority that affects the way you think. You have self-authority, and I'm going to explain these to you, that affects the way you think. And then I add scriptural authority, which should affect your thinking. Now, here's what people do. Just think for a minute. And this is biblical. So I'm not just giving you a science lesson. Under the social authority, you're allowing society to determine what you believe is true. You're allowing social elements to determine for you what is truth. For instance, I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Baptist. I'm an American. That's, that's your social authority affecting what you think is true. You want to hear what God says about everybody? Everybody is equal. Everybody is sufficient. Everybody is, where did he say it to us? I created us in what? How did he create? His image. We are equal on the playing field with God. Every human being on this planet is equal. But under social authority, you are conditioned by your society to think a specific way. Don't think for a minute, and I know we've talked about it before, that your TV and your music is not doing that to you 24-7. They are pushing you the exact opposite direction of scriptural authority. Tell me I'm wrong. You just look what you put into your heads. You wanted to say I was wrong, didn't you? I saw you laugh. <laughs> okay. Now, I know, it. I know it was a bad choice of words. Self-authority. Let's get back. Self-authority. Don't miss this. Please hear this part. And force yourself to really confront the issue. Because I know enough of you well enough to know, along with me, that this is the most difficult place in that self-authority. You know what self-authority is? is where you think that your opinion and your view is correct. And you dogmatically stick to that behavior pattern that's self-destructive in your life and the lives of others. Because you think you know so much about something. And what we do that's amazing is we do things that try to convince us that we're right. So we will surround ourselves with people who do the thing like my dad always does, which is they praise you. Even though they're wrong too, but you will pull people around you that will go with your self-created lie and your self-created dogma. To where you don't hear truth. You don't obey truth, you resist truth, and then you justify it because it's called self-authority. Are you with me? It is the most destructive thing you can do to yourself. It will ruin your life, guaranteed. Scripture tells you that you should live a surrendered life to a true authority that should be followed. And that authority is Christ. What amazes me about society... Why would anybody want to say no to Jesus? Show me one thing he did that requires you saying no to him. Has he ever done anything offensive to anyone? Yet you have people who hate him with a passion. You know why they hate him? Because their self-authority or their social authority is more important to them than the truth of who Jesus actually was. They will go read other books. They will listen to other things that are totally contrary to scriptural authority. They will chase after aliens put us here. They will chase after other religions. They will chase everything else but will not look 
and study and research scriptural authority. And what's hard for people is they go into churches around the country and they will go into places where their social supersedes scriptural. Are you with me? Have I lost you yet? Which takes very fine people that are desiring to know truth and puts them in a wrong mindset because they don't question the social authority. They don't question their own self-authority. They just accept it. I mean, it's true. I could stand up here as a pastor simply because I have that title And I could teach you a lot of hogwash, and there would be a lot of people that would believe it simply because, well, he's the pastor. He must know what he's talking about. And never, there are people that would never go check me. I did a test once. I did an experiment. I had a Sunday school class about 10 years ago, and the kids weren't really listening. You know, they're teenagers. And I started reading scripture, and I changed the whole text and started reading about eating everybody and just went through this real morbid, bizarre explanation of how they were eating each other. And, and these kids are sitting there listening to me like, oh, wow. Wow, is that true? No. I just made it up. But you all sat there. They did because it's like, well, you must, be, you must be telling me the truth. You have to be wise enough in your life, especially young guys. You have to be wise enough to go search out what truth actually is. You have to. And it starts with you first dealing with your thinking. It always starts there. Jesus comes along and he says, listen, you give me your list and I'll give you mine. And you follow my list and I'll take yours. It's it's an exchange that occurs when you enter into a relationship with Christ. His whole intention for you, and you can put the scripture back up again. His whole intention for you is one thing. And that is for you to experience life in its fullness. That's his goal. He wants you to know God, your father. He wants you to know him. He wants you to live your life fully and completely, not halfway. That's why a man who's going to be brutally tortured and hung on a cross is speaking this way. He understands that there's something beyond this. Beyond this. I mean, did you all just eat? You're going to eat a few hours from now? You're going to eat later on this evening? Guess what? You'll get up tomorrow and have to do the same thing again and again and again and again because it doesn't last. He's talking about and has a mindset that is so eternal in value. He knows exactly where he's going. He knows exactly what's going to happen. That's why he's telling the apostles, you guys need to listen to me. That's what, and he's telling us, you'll see it in the text. Listen to me, he says. Put your hope in something that actually has value. Money will not do it. Sorry, I hate to disappoint you. Our nice cars won't do it. Nice houses won't do it. It will temporarily please you but you're still going to be left wanting. You just will. Go ask anybody who's in a retirement home. I've said it before. Go talk to older people who are sitting in retirement homes waiting to die. They will tell you, he just told you the truth. It doesn't matter now. Because it doesn't. Because you're guaranteed death, right? Okay. So look at what he's saying. When Jesus had spoken the words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, that is an intimate statement in the Aramaic. It's uh, Abba. The hour has come, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Do you see the motive? Do you know that you've been glorified if you're a believer? And I'll give you a little more about that. By the way, the word glory and glorify in your scriptures is a very difficult word to translate. It goes through a progression. There's about 25 different meanings for it. But we'll move on. Um, Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh. Guess what? Who's in charge now? According to Scripture, who's in charge of everyone? Christ. To give eternal life to all whom whom you have given him. Guess where your salvation came from? We've looked at this already before, but stay with me. God gave you to Jesus. If you accept Christ as your Savior, you were a gift from God to his Son. Again, 
another movement of intimacy, also a movement of ownership. Remember when God told Adam to name the animals? That's ownership. Adam, name the animals. That means they're yours. These people, they're yours. Ownership. Next. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Glorified you on earth, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me. Do you see how many times he's saying it? Must mean something if you repeat it this many times, right? And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. That's good for now. Jump down to 16. So do you see the pattern of connection? That's not just loose words. And do you see him saying anything at all to God about, oh, stop the pain, stop the heartache, stop it, help me, save me? Do you see any of that? Mm -mm. As a believer, human being, but I'm going to speak to believers specifically. It's all people, but believers. You were never told ever that living in this world would be easy. Never. You were told just the opposite. We read it previously in the earlier text where Jesus is telling his guys, there will be trouble. You will have trouble. I got a quote here from Dr. Constables, and I like, I don't know where he got it. I'm sure he got it from someone else. But look what he says here. Christianity was never meant to withdraw a man from life. It was meant to equip him better for life. Christianity does not offer us release from problems. It offers offers us a way to solve problems. Christianity does not offer us an easy peace. It offers us a triumphant warfare. Christianity does not offer us a life in which troubles are escaped and evaded. It offers us a life in which troubles are faced and conquered. The Christian must never desire to abandon the world. He must always desire to win the world. Put the verse back up. Verse 16. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Talking about believers. You're not of this world. You live here. And you're here for a reason. A very distinct, purposeful reason. And you'll see it again in the text. Go to verse, give me verse 17, I think, is the next one I want. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You know what the word sanctify means? It means you actually have a great purpose. That's the best way to explain it. He is saying, bring them into it. Bring them into their purpose. Sanctify them in truth. Move into the truth of who you actually are and what Christ has actually done. Again, the biggest problem that we have as people is believing what God says especially when it comes down to him saying, I'm in you, you were in me, we're one. The Father, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me. You've seen the scriptures. You know what the difficulty is for us? We really can't believe that once we're a believer, we literally are united with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I wanted to do a a drawing thing for you up here, so just try and picture it in your head. This is how brilliant this mechanism is. You have God glorifying the Son. The Son then in turn glorifies the Father. Okay? Then Jesus glorifies us. The Holy Spirit that indwells us glorifies the Son and gives us the ability to glorify the Son and the Father. There is a mechanism that's in play where the three parts of the Trinity have included us in that whole glorification process. If you understand that, then when you come to trials and tribulations in your life, you are going to have a response that is going to be, wait a minute, I and the Father are one, I and the Son are one, I am in the family, I have a hope, I have a hope that is far greater than what's going to happen to me tomorrow. And your heart is going to move in the direction of, wait a minute, 
I have a sense of peace. It's not that you're going to be stupid and go, oh, well, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm just, no, you're going to hurt. You'll hurt. But there's something there that you have that's far beyond thinking in terms of worldly. It is a relationship that is absolutely distinct and clearly defined biblically. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are taking within yourself the Trinity. You are that connected to God. Hard to believe, isn't it? Can you grasp it? No, it's hard to grasp. But it's the truth. It's the truth. And remember when he said, when you have the truth, it does what? Right. So if you're not living a life that is free of trauma in your thinking, for instance, and I'm going to try and navigate this as best I can. If you are a Christian who is afraid of God, there's something wrong with your thinking. I can't say it any other way. If you're a Christian and you have no hope, there's something wrong with your thinking. I'm not being mean. If you are self-destructive, you don't understand your value. Okay? If you're not loving people, there's something wrong with your thinking. If you don't feel loved by God, there's something wrong with your thinking. Secular counseling will tell you exactly what I just told you. They deal with a bunch of kids who don't even know how to let someone touch them. I have been around Christians that will pull away from other people because they're not comfortable. I struggle with it. I know Christians, said Christians, that continually look for everybody to do something wrong. That is a psychosis. You can call it a spiritual condition, but the problem is Somewhere, some way, somebody stole that person's innocence and convinced them that it is their job as a believer to judge everybody. That is a psychosis. It's, it's messed up brain thinking. Scripture itself tells you it's wrong. Where does Scripture tell you it's wrong? 1 Corinthians 13. Love hardly even notices when others do it wrong. How can we read that and not accept that as a fact? Love is patient. Love is kind. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace. Do you have joy or peace? If that's missing from your life, something's wrong. Especially if you're a Christian. Because you have all of it. You have it. It's there. The problem is, is self-authority is overriding biblical authority in your life. I struggle with this. I know you all do. We're all people. We all struggle with this. Jesus wouldn't have come if we didn't. We all struggle with it. I should be able to live my life not being... Oh, here, let me give you one of my psychoses. I'll give you, I've given it to you before. We, and again, I'm, I'll jump back on track here. We were talking about neuroconnections. And they were showing us neuroconnections and what they actually do. We were watching a video of actual neuroconnections. I brilliantly, and that's just a play on words developed neural connections that made it to where when I drive my car, everybody is an enemy. That is actually a neural connection. I asked the guy. He said, yes. He said, what you've done is you have repeatedly done it over and over again. Now, how do we know that? How many of you can do this? You know what that is? That's a neural connection. Now, watch. I'm going to show you you don't have a heavy developed one. Do it. You ought to do it. Now, you ready? Let me show you that you don't have one. Switch real quick, and now do it right. Anybody have to think? It's because the neural connection's not there. It's the reason why if we sat down to play drums, we can't do what Tim did, because Tim has developed neural connections, or what Steve does. So you have neural connections you've developed. The reason why children that have been traumatized, trauma develops neural connections. And by the time they hit adulthood, they have strong neural connections that they've developed from their childhood that is causing them to say and do things that hurt themselves and others, and they don't even know why. Because it's a natural function of the brain now. 
It's the reason why if you move towards one of those kids, they jump back. Instinct. If you're living in fear and anxiety all the time, aside from mental issues, mental illness caused from a a chemical imbalance. Now, there are chemical imbalances that can cause things. But if you're a normal functioning person and you're living in anxiety and fear all the time, you have developed neural connections that are wrong. And you have to sever them. And you can sever them. You can sever them. You know how you sever them? By building new neural connections. And what is it that the scripture tells you to do? Renew your mind. mind. What's that mean? I just wanted to say it so bad to the guy. Hey, we're already up on you. The scripture already says this. But that's what the guy was telling us. He said that he has to bring people to a point of peace so they can hear. And then he starts walking them through thinking correctly. You want to change your life? You really want to change your life? You want to change your level of happiness? Then go to scriptural authority. Stop taking it upon yourself to determine your life's goals and let God tell you because he's the guy that made you. Not to be disrespectful, Lord. He's the one that made you. Think about it. Wouldn't it be logical to follow the advice of the one who constructed you? It is so strong. One more thing, and I'll wrap up because I went on a rant. You were designed. <laughs> you were designed in such a way. This is how brilliant you're designed. Do you know that a baby, when a mother breastfeeds the baby, her hand on the back of the baby's neck. Being there causes the baby's body to absorb more of the nutrients just because the mother's hand is touching the neck of the baby. Isn't that amazing? Do you know what the reverse of that is? No touch, what happens to a person? Unloving touch, just predator-type touch, what's it do to a person? Okay, words, violent, aggressive words, Foul, unkind, selfish words, what do you think they do to people? You're developing neuro connections. You're actually training people to operate in trauma or toxic stress by using language and things that you shouldn't use. Aggression. Do you see it? Do you see what your scripture's trying to do for you? Do we not have a problem right now with killing in the schools? Did any of you, my age and older, ever see that when you were growing up? Nope. They weren't doing it. They do now. You know why? Empathy? They now know that there's a serious crisis in our thinking in our societies now. We're losing empathy. That is the ability to look at other people, to simplify the definition to look at other people and feel for them. Instead, we are aggressive, disconnected, and it's killing our youth. They are now trying to figure out in the psych, the psych world, whatever you want to call it, they're trying to figure out how to offset it because they're finding out that a bit large part of the problem is the fact that people sit and do this all day long. There's no face time because we are designed to touch each other to look at each other. We physically are designed to be connected, not through media. And they're watching kids, generations of kids, who don't have the ability to properly respond relationally. And you wonder why divorce charted. You wonder why murder's off the charts now, why our babies are killing babies now. Why should the church... Let me ask it another way. If we're supposed to be in the world but not of the world, what's that mean? If you're a student of your scriptures, what should we be doing in the world? Yeah. Yeah. How do you think the church is doing? Not our church necessarily. I'm saying the church as a whole. Yeah, pretty bad. Pretty bad. We're not, we're doing very little... Stepping into the world. 
Guys, you need to know that going and sitting with a bunch of little kids and looking at these kids, knowing that they've been abused, you think that's easy? I'm going. Now, that's not a boast. I'm going because I'm scared to go. I'm going because we need to go. And if you look at the rest of the text, you see that we are sent. In John 17, you see Jesus saying it. We are sent into the world. Why? To offset what's going on out there. I, I don't know how else to say it. we got to get fired up, is what I guess I'm trying to say, about stepping into the reality of what's going on here in our lives, in this world. Look at the division. The division in the nation is off the charts. But think about it. The division in the church is off the charts. And the whole lesson here in John 17 is unity. The whole lesson in the Bible is unity. A commitment. And they've shown, and I'm, like I said, I'm going to wrap up. You need to believe me because I'm not the only one who says this. Non-believers who study psychology will tell you this is the truth. Don't miss this. A person who is struggling with depression or anxiety or fear, the most healthy thing you can do is go serve other people. It is a fact. You want to get more unhealthy, draw in on yourself and become more closed and reserved. You will die in that. It's good to step out and engage the world. It's good as a Christian. It's good to feel the pain. It's good to feel the heartache. Why? It's a fact. Too much entertainment, too much relaxation, too much playing. It's just ruins you. Ruins you. I'm watching and I'll shut up. I will. I really will. I'm watching, I think I've told this before, I never remember who all I talked to because I talked to so many people during the week. I'm watching my youngest daughter, and I may have said this to you before, who is working with Alzheimer patients. She is having to clean them up after they go to the bathroom on themselves. She is having to feed them and bathe them. And she is having to watch them die. She called me one day to ex tell me about it, how she watched the color leave the feet of this one woman and how she, I'm not trying to grocery all out, but she lost all of her body function. And Anna is getting it. My Anna is getting it because she's facing death and she's de there in the trenches. She's getting it. If you ever get a chance to look at her Facebook, look at it. The girl's got a heart that just, 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 bursting with affection for people and kindness. She's not self-focused. Think about it. She's pouring her life into the lives of others. Self-focused thinking? Coming to church just to be comfortable? You come to church to worship. You come to church to go out there and reach as many people as you can. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling, the, telling you to go out there and try and save souls. That's not our job. That is not, and you've got a lot of preachers that try to tell you it is. It's not your job. It's God's job to save people. It's your job to love them and engage them and encourage them and help them. And I guarantee you that when you start doing that, God will reach those people he wants to reach through you, and you get to go with him and be a part of him bringing someone in to the Lord. Not, I don't care if they come to church here or not. They can go to church anywhere they want. It's not about getting people in here, but it is about engaging the world because our Christ sent us to engage the world. Keep living selfish lives, those of you that struggle with selfishness, and that's all you're going to get. And then you'll wonder why you're so depressed and frustrated. Start living for others and watch what you actually receive. It's blessing. It really is. All right, that's enough for you.
Come back next week to get beat up. I hope you don't think that's what it is. Because I, I, I really am confident that we're a church right now. We're moving. I mean, we're actually starting to go now, move, function. It's slow grind because it's, it's fearful. It scares us to step out and think, you know what, I'm going to go talk anyway, even though I don't have all the right answers. I'm going to go love on that person. I'm not going to get mad at this person that just cut me off and flip them off. You know, you got to get to the point where you go, no, I'm going to love that person. I'm going to love them even though they did. Because you don't know what's going on in their world. You have no idea what's going on in their world. You know, it's like the woman that ran the red light the other day. You know, I don't know what was going on. Maybe her husband was dying and she just wasn't thinking. But what did everybody else want to do? And I've been guilty of that. Haven't I, Susan? <laughs> Let's pray ourselves out. Lord, again, thank you for you. Thank you for your word. Lord, anybody in here who does not know who you are, the true person that you are, Lord, I pray that you give us opportunity to talk to them. If they don't know the Lord as you are, then give us that opportunity, please. Because, Lord, it's a blessing to know you. You have been the greatest blessing in my life. I know there's others out here that agree with me. I am so grateful for the fact that you saved me from me. Because you know which direction I was going. Thank you for that deep affection you have for us. That your goal is that we have hope and joy and peace. That we have a full life. A complete life. Not one that is just bogged down. But one that is bold. Lord I pray you keep teaching all of us. Me included. And we do pray for those children. A great circle Lord. All 90 of them that you would bless them, that you would help them, that you would help their families. Again, thank you for you. Amen. Thanks for coming.